All right, guys, free info Friday for real, finally. Yes, I was going to do it this week, and here we are this week. So, um, yeah, let's just get right into it. So what I'll do first is I'm going to answer the general questions, and then I have some training questions that we'll cut away to so I can show some some of the training movements and some of the exercises. So, um, yeah, feel free to, you know, for future reference, definitely feel free to send me those questions if you, if you want a movement reference, uh, if you want, uh, you know, kind of a specific, whether it's a specific movement or just kind of a general set of movements. Um, I... I'll try and keep it brief, you know, so for example, this week, um, you know, I'll give you a kind of a little preview of, say, uh, of, of, for the answer, and then if you want to, I guess, the, the if, you, if you want the the more complete answer, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about when we get there, um, you know, you'll f- feel free to hit me up, and we can we can approach that a bunch of different ways, but um, yeah, here we go. Um, first question, so, all right, so this, this is a fun question. Uh, it's actually not a training question. It's a tech question, which uh, I'm, which I'm, kind of happy to be able to talk about because I don't get to geek out too much anymore. And the question is basically, what are some programming languages that tech artists should know well versus languages that they should be aware of just for professional confidence? Um, so let's, let's set some, <clears throat> let, let, let's, I guess let's, let's set the ground level here. So a tech artist or a technical artist in games and film, uh, you know, basically in digital production, and they have different names, but the actual job, the best way to describe it is somebody who is not a super good digital artist, so they're not a they're not an awesome modeler or animator. They're not well, some of them actually nowadays are really good programmers, but that's not their job. Their job is not to be writing, you know, deep in the game code or in the, you know, I guess whatever the equivalent is on on the film side. But these are the people who sit between the artists, like say on a game, for example, that's what I have the most experience doing is so on, on a video game, right? These are the guys that sit between the artists and the programmers and help figure out workflows, write tools for the artists, uh, help the artists get content into the game, into the engine, they troubleshoot, they debug, and then there are some more technical art-related tasks that I, I won't go too deep into, but things like um, things like setting up lighting, setting up. Uh, yeah, like I said, I don't, don't want to go too deep, too deep into this because I'm gonna have to like I'm gonna have to explain materials and shaders and all that good stuff. But I don't know, if you want to hear me talk about that, hit me up. I'm I'm happy to walk you through game production since I spent way too much of my life doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, so the question is basically what, what languages do I think are required and what languages uh, should, should people just be aware of? So for a technical artist, um, I'd say the two languages you should absolutely, absolutely know are uh, Python and C Sharp. And full disclosure, I work for Unity Technologies. If you're familiar with Unity, um, you know that our main, the main language that our, our engine uses is C Sharp. That's not the reason I say that, um, and I'm not getting paid to say that. It, but the reason the reason is that those are the two languages that I think as a as a person who's developing tools for art content creation or for art content management, those are the two languages you're going to end up using most. Now, you know, Python just because all the content creation applications like 3D Studio Max, or Maya, Blender, um, way too many other ones to name, um, have some you know use use Python and C or C Sharp to some extent. And if you're writing standalone tools, especially if you're on Windows, you'll probably end up using something like C Sharp. And you know, you don't have to be you don't have to be a like a, a, a just super legit like to the metal, well as close to the metal as you can get with something like Python or C Sharp coder. But you definitely want to be competent in you know patterns and language specific algorithms and data structures. So those are the yeah. So those are definitely the two I would say you should you should know. Obviously, I, I don't want to use the term by heart, but you should be very, very comfortable like just jumping into a Python or a C Sharp program. As far as languages I think you should be aware of, um, obviously shading languages. And the reason I don't say you should, you should be an expert in shading languages is because I, th- I think they're on, well, hmm, this is a weird, this, okay. So on some productions, I, I'm starting to see, uh, um, and somebody please feel free to push back on me, on larger productions especially, I'm starting to see people who are more specialized in that sort of thing. So, I mean, I guess that could be a technical artist, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities. So I'm in like, um, you know, I wouldn't say that uh, you need to be an expert in sh- like, a, a, like a, you know, a, I guess a to the graphics card expert in shading languages, but uh, it's good to at least again it's, it's good to like understand it's good to like be able to look at the code know what's going on at least at a high level it's good to be able to like make changes if you need to I mean and, and I know there's a lot of 
there are a lot more visual tools for creating shares. And at this, and I'm, I'm going to go a little deep into this. So if you're not interested, jump to the next question. <clears throat> but um, there, there are a lot of tools for creating shaders. And if you know what a shader is, a shader is basically, so if you think about a video game, right, you have, um, so like a, like a video game that's made up of, of 3D objects, not all I know, but the majority of like, say, games you play on consoles nowadays are made up of 3D objects. And a shader is one of the things that kind of describes the surface property. So for example, if I have a wall, right, the wall is just... Um, the, the shader is the thing that says, hey, make the wall look like it's made out of bricks. Um, that's the, the probably the, the short answer. And those are, you know, either can be written as bits of code or nowadays they're like visual tools you can use. So you don't actually have to write the code for that. But um, yeah, so shading languages. Uh, let's see, what else do I think you should be aware of? JavaScript, just because it's everywhere. Um, and I think more studios are moving towards things like web tools so it probably wouldn't hurt to at least be able to jump onto projects like that. Um, C++, just because, you know, you might be doing plugin work. So for something like Maya, uh, and again, you don't have to be an expert, but be comfortable reading, reading the code, you know, using the, I guess, the development flow. So, you know, if you're on Windows, at least know the, the Visual Studio C++ workflow, um, you know, how to use the debugger, things like that. Let's see, what other languages? I, I, I'm gonna say Rust, but not really, just because I know there's some efforts that, personally, I think look really cool to try and get Rust to be a first class uh, game engine language. But um, that's just more of an indulgence because I, it's a project I wanna see succeed. Um, And I think that's it. I'm, you know, I'm not going to say things like Swift or Objective C, just because those are so so platform specific. And I, I mean, who knows? Maybe in five years, when Apple has killed everybody off, and we're all just we're all, we're all developing on Apple, that might be the thing. But um, yeah, who knows? So to recap, um, Python and C sharp required. Uh, C++, JavaScript, uh, shading languages, you should definitely at least be uh, reading competent and workflow competent. And then, yeah, then other things out there, like like I said, like Rust and things that are starting to kind of pop up in the space might be worth looking at. But um, yeah, cool. Moving to the next question. Uh, so this is one of those questions that I'm going to just kind of talk about in brief, like I mentioned, and then I'll actually do a, a whole video on it next week because it's a, it's a good topic. But the question is, um, how about a guide to recover in between sessions? And that's definitely something I, I care about nowadays since I'm uh, effectively doing two sessions. In fact, I you know, just got back from jujitsu a little while ago and I'm about to jump into another session, getting my, my actual uh, Rise 45 session here in about a half an hour or whenever I get done recording this. So I mean, at a high level, I mean, it's really tough, right? Because, you know, if you're just talking about day to day, um, that's, that's pretty simple. I mean, I would say if you're going, you know, if you, if you, if you only do one workout a day, um, hydration's key, you know, make sure, and when I say hydration, make sure you're taking something like, uh, like, like an element or a noon, something to keep your electrolytes up, uh, what with, with your water, just, um, that's probably, I mean, for me, I've noticed, I don't know why, but, uh, recently that's been kind of one of the more key things probably because I'm sure it has something to do with my diet, but, um, so hydration, um, nutrition, make sure, you know, make, make sure that you're, you're just your daily. And then if you need, um, I mean, if you're working out hard enough that you need some sort of, you know, peri-workout nutrition, make sure those are dialed. Um, I like to, you know, I, I include mobility work as part of, um, as part of recovery and just because I think, you know, there's, and I don't have links to these, sorry, I'm, I'll try and dig some up and if anybody's interested, but you know, there's some, and they're probably cursory. They're probably not very, they're probably not very, def, I don't want to say defensible, but they're probably, let's just say this, look, take, take them with a grain of salt studies. Okay. Especially because nowadays everybody loves to throw that word research around and talk about how the science is settled. Right. Um, that, that show that things like mobility work and stretching actually do help to, you know, reduce, uh, you know, reduce blood pressure and things like that. And I mean, and, and we do know that, I mean, that, that, that uh, they can, you know, downregulate 
your uh, your nervous system activity, right? So, you know, if you're going from sympathetic to parasympathetic, you know, with things like breathing and very simple movement and maybe even some SMR are good. So make sure you're, you're definitely getting that stuff in. Um, you know, my favorite... <laughs> My, my favorite cool and this is something that like you know you should be doing after your workout you know if you're not if you're not doing a proper cool down after your workout like you're you're leaving recovery on the table which means you're leaving gains on the table so i know it's not sexy it doesn't look cool on instagram um but do your freaking like cool downs do your you know do your recovery work and uh, i mean and, and there's there's ways to do like very short ones you know uh dr john russin you guys know i'm a huge fan of ppsc he has um and, and I'll, I'll try and toss up a link to this somewhere I'm able to do a post on it, but he has a, he has a system called the, um, what's it actually called? It's not, it's the performance, I think it's called the, I think he calls it the performance recovery system. I know I should know that, um, but it's, it's five steps and really it's just, you know, it's just SMR. So some biphasic stretching, some kind of some, some flow based movement. So, you know, some very simple GFM animal flow, uh, some low intensity, steady state. Uh, let's see, that's, that's, and then what did I say? Uh, let's see, SMR, biphasics, uh, flow, low intensity, oh, and then, and then some breath work. So, you know, some, some positional breath work. So really similar. You can knock that out in, you know, eight to 10 minutes, depending on how extensive you want to go. So that's, and that, that, I think that's like really where, that's really where preparation for your next workout begins, right? For your next, I mean, you're, the, you know, you know, prep for your next training session starts as soon as your last one's finished. So make sure that you're, you know, make sure that you're getting recovery in, make sure that you're going and getting some hydration. And I mean, I like to, I like to take some, you know, take a noon tablet or, or, or an element packet, you know, right after I work out, you know, just as, as part of my recovery. So that's, so in a nutshell, yeah, I mean, you know, hydration, pre workout nutrition, general nutrition, um, cool down work, which includes, which should include mobility, you know, and, and of course sleep. I mean, you know, make sure you're doing what you need to do to get your sleep. So like I said, we'll, we'll go, we'll go much deeper into this, um, next week just because like I said, there's, there's so much I could talk about and maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll even, I'll even, uh, I'll do like a real time ver like run through of the performance recovery system if anybody's interested, but, uh, yeah. So cool. Good question. Um, next question. So since I just talked about pre-workout nutrition, uh, so the next question is what is my favorite pre-workout supplement? Um, that's a good question because I've used a lot and I actually am not a big pre work or I haven't been a big pre-workout guy. And that's not to, that's not because I'm like some amazing athlete or I'm, you know, I'm always, you know, I'm super tuned up and just ready to go. That's, that's not true. It's just something I didn't do. Um, but, uh, you know, with, since I was doing this FNX challenge and I got a big box of supplements, I figured I'd try some of the stuff that uh, came with it. And I gotta say, um, the, uh, and I mentioned this, but the recharge plus really, really has, has been working for me and honest, and I'm, I'm only taking like half a serving before uh, each workout. So, and, and it's doing well. And I mean, honestly, I use the word honestly way too much. Um, I know people are gonna think I'm lying to you, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I would say, I think, was it, you know, this week and last week, uh, you know, the, the two weeks are, you know, are really the two weeks I've been on it. And for example, my jujitsu performance, I've just felt like I felt really good. Like, I mean, I've had really good, I haven't done a ton of sparring, but the sparring rounds I've done have felt really good. And my drilling has felt, even on days where I was kind of dragging a little bit, you know, after taking my, my, uh, my pre-workout, um, I, I, you know, I went into class and just, I, at the very least, I felt like I could drill competently. So I'm, um, so yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that I'll probably cycle on and off just because I don't want to, I don't want to get to the point, you know, I don't want to be the guy who's like dry scooping, you know, a half a tub of pre-workout just to, to get amped up. Cause that probably means you have some other problems <laughs> that you need to address. But, um, but real quick, so what my Perry workout shape looks like and you know, I, like I said, I take half before, uh, before jujitsu, because usually, usually my days I do jujitsu first and then I'll do my workout afterwards. So half before and then rest a little bit and then half, probably about a, a half an hour before I do my next workout. So you, and it's, um, toss in some of the recharge, some of the, the recharge plus, um, some of the FNX recovery. I need to figure out a better way to place my camera. So this is easier, but, uh, so these are just BCAAs. Um, the old school, old school creatine label. So some creatine and a little bit of, there we go. A little bit of glutamine. I need to practice that because uh, yeah, I, I am never going to be a, 
a proper influencer if I can't show you guys the products, right? Um, so that's it. And, and like I said, you know, it's so, so it's, it's some to give me some, some training energy and then enough to kind of, and then some to like sort of in between give me a little bit of a recovery boost. And I, I'm, I'm finding it's been working for me, you know, as long as, and like I said, as long as I stay on top of my hydration too, um, i I'm finding that doing the two sessions a day is not horrible. Um, you know, I can, I can get good sleep and I'm not, you know, not feeling totally jacked up. So yeah. So, uh, if you guys want to try any of these, uh, hit me up. I've got a, I've got a code I can give you that'll save you some money on your order. And, um, yeah, that's that. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys, especially if you've tried some of this or, you know, if you have a, a favorite, uh, from, you know, and it could be any brand. Like, I'm, I mean, this, like I said, you know, huge, huge thanks to FNX. And honestly, they are the driver for me doing this, but there's a lot of good products out there and I definitely use other stuff. So, uh, let's see. All right. Oof. Uh, the last of the non-training questions, and I'm going to try and, <laughs> I, I, I said I'm going to try and uh, not go down too many ideological and political uh, or partisan rabbit holes with this one because it's tough. But the question is, um, how is the sport of jujitsu making adjustments in the pandemic? And um, all right, well, let's start with the, 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 the truly neutral answer. So on the event side, uh, tournaments, competitions. So tournaments are, 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 have started, have been happening in a lot of places and are continuing to happen. And I think because they're kind of sort of bound by whatever regulations or, well, I don't want to use the word, but whatever um, stipulations people are putting in place around events, you know, so it's things like, um, so it's like, you know, no spectators. Um, you have to have I think some of the bigger tournaments, like maybe some of the fight to wins and stuff like that are doing things in a bubble, quote unquote. But I think some of the smaller tournaments, it's more just like, you know, it's making, you know, no, no spectators, limited, limited team members. And so for example, I think like, you know, competitors can maybe have, yeah, that was embarrassing. All right, let's see. I may edit that out. I may not. <clears throat> um, so limited, um, uh, limited team members, so like I think coaches can come, but I think like team even team spectators can't come. So, I mean, they're I'm gonna say they're doing what they have to do. You know, I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna detract or or laud anybody for quote unquote being safe because well, you guys if you if you if you follow me closely on social media, you know what I think about a lot of this. So, and we'll leave it at that. Um, the interesting conversation is what's gone on as far as training goes just because let's be honest we've seen different parts of the country and, and, and I, I, I can I mean I can only speak for the I'm, I'm only going to speak for the U.S. because that's what I've seen I, I, I mean I follow a lot of folks on Instagram who are in different parts of the world and I see um, I kind of see what's going on but the reality is I, I'm not really paying attention too much, you know, typical American, right? Sorry. Um, but, um, but, but as far as what's going on here, like I said, I mean, we've seen different parts of the country impose different things. And, you know, some people are, some people are, are, are staying within, within those lines, which, okay, cool. I, I mean, to the point where I think I'm not going to say which, but some bigger, some bigger organizations have even taken upon themselves to draft up, um, you know, safety protocols that they, that they require their, their, um, their affiliates or their franchises to, to undergo, which, okay, cool. You know, I mean, if, if that's what you feel like you need to do, you know, cool. Uh, and some folks have just kind of said, you know, we're just going to, we're going to do it with you. You know, I mean, actually one guy I can talk about. So uh, if you guys have been following uh, Greg Anderson at all, so Greg Anderson is the export of Seattle police officer who at the very, when, when all this stupidity started going down, made a, a really great video saying, you know, calling out other police officers for basically violating people's constitutional rights, right? For, for arresting people who were surfing, you know, on, on, the, on, on a, it's not even a technicality. It was just, I mean, it was, it was basically on, on orders from, let's just say legal, legal entities that really didn't have the place to be drawing up the, the, the lines of enforcement that they did. And, and we'll just leave it at that and don't at me about it. Cause I don't care. I'm not going to discuss it with you. Um, and you know, he, he has a jujitsu school, a jujitsu school and CrossFit gym up in, um, is it Lake Stevens? I think in Lake Stevens. So uh, sorry if you don't know the area. It's, it's a little bit north of Seattle um, proper. And 
you know, he, 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 just loved, he did what everybody did at the beginning. He was prudent because, you know, our information was bad in, back in February and March. So he shut his gym down and, you know, kind of waited to see what happened. But, you know, as the numbers started to kind of do what they did, he said, you know what, we're going to open back up. This is crazy. And so he's been open since, I want to say since April or May. And, you know, and, and, he, and he's not being, you know, he's not being secretive about it. I mean, you go to his social media, you see, you'll see pictures of him training and he's, and he, on his own podcast, he says, Hey, you know, I'm not going to hide from people. This is my livelihood. This is my business. And I'll be a little partisan and say, yeah. And you know, Hey, if Twitter can do it, then any other private business should be able to do whatever they want. And yeah, section 230. Okay. Whatever. But um, so, you know, you ha- and some people and other people have kind of done that too. You know, I mean, I know other schools have kind of said maybe, maybe they've been a little bit more fight club about it, but they've kind of, you know, they've kind of just gone out to some people, you know, reached out to their members and said, Hey, you know, you folks who are still paying, you know, come, come on in, you know? And I mean, I think everybody's kind of doing what they think is best. I mean, I, I, you know, I've, I've seen some, some folks have, you know, have, have put up outdoor training studies, you know, have gotten, have gotten tents or built uh, kind of, you know, outdoor spaces around their gym and put mats out, you know, outside so they can, so they can train. Um, yeah. I mean, like I said, the short answer is I think people are doing what they think is best for them. And honestly, I, I don't fault or like I said, I'm not going to fault or laud anybody for doing what they're doing. Um, you know, the people that want to, that want to stay within governmental lines and be safe and quote unquote, and, you know, do what they think is proper. Okay, cool. But at the same time, the guys who are going all fight club and saying, you know what, we're just going to get back to training. Okay, cool. You know, I mean, especially some of the smaller gyms who are like, who are not maybe part of a big org or maybe, you know, I mean, who are just kind of out on their own doing their thing. It's like, look, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, you're not getting help from the government and, I don't think anybody, especially if this is something that you're putting all your free time and free resources into, whether that means it's your full-time job or even more respectably, it's something that you have another job that you've been doing so you can pay for this, you know, and keep this going. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't fault people for doing that. And, you know, I know there's people out there who are like, oh, well, you know, they're, they should be staying home and saving lives and, you know, they're going to infect other people. And it's like, well, maybe, but... I mean, like I said, I'm not, I'm not going to get too far down that, I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole with anybody. And like I said, don't, don't at me about it. Cause I'm either going to ignore or delete your comment just cause it's, it's something I'm done discussing with people. Um, so, you know, that was, the question was, what did I think? And that's, that's kind of what I think the short is, the short is people are doing what they feel like they need to do and is best for them. And, you know, like I said, one more time, I don't falter a lot anybody for that. What I do falter a lot of people for is, um, people who are getting onto other people, you know, um, I, the whole, you know, whenever I see a thread on Facebook or screenshots of Instagram of people who are like, yep, I've reported your business. It's like, wow, you're a, you're a fucking ass. And if you know me, you know, I don't swear very often. So obviously I'm very upset about that. Um, that's the one thing that, yeah, that's the one thing that really chaps my hide. I mean, you know, be an adult, you know, be, you know, take, take, you know, you have your own agency, be responsible for yourself, do what you think is best for you. And I mean, like I said, if things were different, if people were dropping dead in the streets, um, okay, fine. But then if that were the case, I think, I I think it would be, it would not be so easy for people to be so divided ideologically about this. So anyway, all right, I've, I've gone a little bit down, I've, I've started to go down some rabbit holes and, um, I, like I said, I don't want to do that. So that's, I, th- I think that's it for the questions. Yeah. So that's it for the, for the conversational part. So let's get to training. All right, friends, the exercise part of free info Friday. So the first question I got about exercises was some recommendations on uh, rotator cuff work. And before I get started, let me add a disclaimer. I know when you start saying things like rotator cuff, people think PT, therapy, all that good stuff. I am none of those things. I'm not a PT, I'm not a therapist, I'm not an ortho, I'm not a, you know, I've, I've done some adjacent coursework, but I'm not licensed and I don't have near the practical hours to say that I can do that stuff. So if you're, if you're coming at this thinking that I'm going to, that this is a diagnosis or a treatment for some injury you might have, no, 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 go, go, go somewhere else. Don't, don't get me sued and kicked off of, off of the internet, please. But uh, if you're like me, 
and you know you just, just want to get some more movement in there maybe you've been sitting at your computer too much over lockdown and you're starting to feel that nerve pinch here and you, know, you want to just get some movement back into your shoulders um that's kind of what i'm going to show you i've got two movements that i like to do actually i have a bunch of movements but i'm going to show you two of them and these these are i think the most bang for your buck movements that are also the simplest um you know one of them is fairly easy one of them is fairly high intensity or can be high intensity but doesn't have to but i think they both hit on kind of all the major sort of points that you want to touch on and it's really quick you don't have to spend hours doing this this is the kind of thing that you can knock out in a couple minutes here and there during the day maybe do it when you wake up maybe do it when you take your break maybe do it uh, as part of your warm-up if you're training and just like that just 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 get some more movement in there so uh, let me back up real quick the first movement is just some really simple shoulder circles and we're just going to go forward backward and alternating right so so I'm just gonna take my shoulders, you know, hands down by my sides, go forward, up, back, down. And I'm gonna smooth that out. Three, four. And then I'm gonna reverse direction. And then we go alternating backwards, so I'm just gonna let one lead. And then we go forward. There you go, easy peasy. And I did five reps each, but however, however the, the number of reps is on you. I mean, you can do it for time, you can do it just, just keep doing it until you, know, until you feel like, hey, okay, I feel good. I feel like my shoulders are warm a little bit and they're a little loose and I like how I'm feeling. You know, it doesn't have to be reps or specific time. It's, it's kind of on you. That's kind of the great thing about a lot of this mobility work. And you know, some days you might feel like you need to do more, some days you might feel like you need to do less. You know, you do you, all right? So the second movement, uh, this is the higher intensity one. It's a little bit more technical, but not terribly. Uh, my, my good friend, Coach John Wolf from the Odd Academy calls this uh, double Rafikis. And if you remember our friend Rafiki from the Lion King, you'll see why. So let me show you the movement real quick and then I'll break it down for you. Let me start here. Drop this up. Down, back around, up, down, back around. And again, however many reps you're feeling. And of course we can switch directions. Okay, but really all we're doing is I'm starting Starting fist in front of me, doing the back fist. Okay, that's that's the Rafiki part. Hope you get the reference. If not, I'm really old. We're gonna pull down, and then we're just gonna come back around to the front. And if we're going the opposite direction, same way. We're gonna come down, pull our fists up, and then just come back down in the front. Now look at what we're not doing, because this is something I see people do at first when they when they first try to do this movement. We, we tend to kind of let our elbows sort of flap, and this is not what we're doing, okay? These are not elbow circles. I mean, they kind of are, but not really. So I don't want to be doing this, okay? I actually want to think about taking my elbows. Imagine like, imagine you have a band around your, your elbows that are just kind of pulling them into your waist, right? Into, into your side. So, and try and just keep them stuck there as much as you can. Really try and get that work into the shoulders. And going back the other way. So, like I said, so those are two of my favorite kind of just bang for buck shoulder exercises, shoulder movements. If you're interested in kind of a more complete program, because honestly, if we're talking about shoulder mobility, then we're going to have to do some things like address what's going on in the neck, maybe what's going on in the T-spine, maybe across this front line. And I, I think I have... I've got bits and pieces of shoulder mobility programs lying around. So if that's something you're interested in, hit me up. I'll, I'll clean something up and send it over to you. Um, but yeah, that's what I got for shoulders. On to number two. All right, friends. Free Info Friday exercise question number two. I got a question about what are some good exercises, some good stepping stone exercises of the pull-up. So the way I like to start when we're training pull-ups is, uh, is actually with just a simple positional isometric. And this is an exercise I got from Coach Aaron Guyette, Battle Rope Exercise on Instagram, you know, Exxon Academy, Battle Ropes Coach, and pretty much just an all-around awesome guy. And he's the first person I ever saw do this, and I thought, wow, this is a really cool thing to do. 
And uh, if you remember, if, you're, if you've been following me, you might remember I posted a kind of a preview uh, on my story a couple days ago where I was doing with maces. But the way you really want to do it is you want to do it with battle ropes or some kind of strap. Like I've got some rings, you can use these ring straps. Uh, I've got these uh, anchor point training bands, which are kind of stronger elastic bands. But you want something that you can, sorry, that you can really like kind of pull against statically, right? So all you're gonna do, um, I'm actually gonna do it up against the wall, but you, you, you wanna do this lying down on the ground. So with, you know, lying down, face down on the ground. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna put your ropes, your, your cables, your straps, whatever, on the ground where you can reach them. And so imagine that, imagine that like they'd be, you know, they'd be, they'd be you know, coming down here. I'm just gonna lay down, I would just be laying down on the ground here, reach up, grab them as high as I can, and then I'm just gonna pull down against them. Okay, like I said, simple positional isometric. I'm just pulling against those ropes. And what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to feel my lat activation, okay? If you don't do a lot of pulling work, your lats probably don't, aren't, aren't super connected, right? So, so you're gonna need to kind of recreate or build that connection, kind of wake those things up. And the reason it's, it's a positional is because, you know, you're gonna start with your arms up, but then eventually, you know, you might move down a little bit and then down a little further, and then down a little further, okay? And the whole time you're just pulling statically against, so you're, so you're not pulling down. It's like you're in a position and because the ropes are static, you're, you're just gonna be activating against them, okay? So that's where I would say start. And um, you know, to, the, to, the, to the person who asked this, you know, if, if we ever end up getting together, we can go over this um, in detail or you know, hit me up, we can jump on a call, whatever. Um, but yeah, that's again, very simple, something you can kind of just throw in whenever and you know, it's, you can do it for time, you can do it for, you know, you do it for reps, so you can say squeeze for a count, let up for a count, squeeze for a count, or you can just squeeze for, you know, 30 seconds, or you can do kind of a biphasic thing. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it, but that's, that's kind of the gist of it. So anyway, hope that helps. Cheers.